this time on Broad and High. Join us for an episode celebrating Jewish cultural heritage, featuring the history of the Jewish Community Center in Bexley. They were very much involved in the cultural life of Columbus. And the genesis of Hebrew beer in New York. Punchline would be don't pass out, pass over. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm Kate Manicky. Welcome back to Broad and High. September is a month of many holy days in the Jewish faith. Rosh Hashanah, which took place earlier this month, is considered to be the Jewish New Year. And today, September 23rd, is Yom Kippur, a day of atonement and reconciliation that is considered the holiest day of the year for those in the Jewish community. In recognition of these important holidays, we're filling this entire episode with stories that come straight out of the Jewish community, both here in Columbus as well as in New York. And there's no better place to start than Bexley, home to Central Ohio's largest Jewish population. This excerpt from our Columbus Neighborhood series tells the story of a community center that continues to play a vital role in our city. Take a look. A longtime Bexley institution unites the Jewish community in all of Central Ohio. It has its origins as the Schoenthal Center downtown on Rich Street. It was based on the settlement house model that was designed to Americanize European immigrants. But after World War II, there was a different need. A real movement began to create a true community center where Jews of every background, whether you were reform or conservative or orthodox, um, no matter where you lived, they really wanted to create a centralized location for all these people to meet. Located at College in Livingston on a campus with many other organizations that are vital to the Jewish community, it's technically just outside of Bexley. Still, it serves all sorts of people with countless activities. There were um, art classes, there were dance classes, there were lots of study groups and literary magazines, and all of these things came out of the Jewish Center. They were very much involved in the cultural life of Columbus and national cultural issues. The Jewish Center also became the home for a lot of organizations that had been scattered throughout the city. You see the Columbus Hebrew School move also from Rich Street, but they moved out east as well. A lot of the Jewish kids of Bexley, after school, would get on a, on a school bus and be schlepped schlepped to Hebrew school. And there may have been a couple who loved it, but uh, look, let's be frank, uh, no 11, 12 year old boy really wants to be schlepped to, to Hebrew school. It really messes up your chance to play baseball and basketball and football in the backyard. But we did it. We knew we were gonna be bar mitzvahed in another year or two. And that was something that uh, our families took very seriously. So all of the neighborhood kids would come there, all of the, the Berwick and Eastmore kids. You saw a lot of the Bexley kids. The swimming pool was enormous. They also would be involved with gallery players and have an actual, almost like a theatrical presentation in the pool. Gallery Players, which is the community theater group, was actually formed because Jews weren't able to get into other theater groups in Columbus. It gave the Jewish actors and actresses a community theater. In 1953, the play Hasty Heart was the first integrated theatrical production by Gallery Players, and in 1957, they did Finian's Rainbow, another hugely successful theatrical production, which was integrated and drew a lot of attention across the city. The bowling alley at the Jewish Center also was the first integrated bowling alley. Um, it was part of the B'nai B'rith Women's Bowling League. I have just joined the, uh, the Men's Jewish Bowling League. I joined it yesterday. I've got a team called the Introverts. And uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about it. The Jewish Community Center is something that is really more of the larger community. Uh, there are lots of people that work out there 
from all over the community. And there are people who send their children to the uh, camps in the summertime and to the preschool uh, during the school year who are not Jewish because it's a good quality program. An amazing variety of programs has been offered at the center. Everything from the City Art League show to country heartthrob Conway Twitty's comeback concert. He wanted this small group to actually be the cover of his new album that was coming out. So he did that with the AZA, which is the Boys B'nai B'rith organization group. Mark your calendars for the 2015 Jewish Book Fair with author visits and other literary events that explore stories of the Jewish experience. And the lobby of the Jewish Community Center will transform into a bookstore. The book fair runs from October 19th through November 30th. Visit columbusjcc.org for details. In this segment, we return to the Jewish Community Center with a performance by Bexley natives and brothers Bill and Bob Cohen. Bill spent more than 40 years reporting for Ohio's public radio and television stations before retiring in 2013. Although he no longer uses his voice to report on government and current events, he continues to use it through music and song. They recently performed a set of popular songs spanning 60 decades, all written by Jewish songwriters. These tunes helped define their generation and shape the music of America. And some just might surprise you. Welcome, I'm Bob Cohen, and uh, I'm Bob's baby brother, Bill. <laughs> In age, we're, we're almost a decade apart, but we do share a love of music and singing. And tonight, we are saluting a group of songwriters from the last century who did something, something amazing. Uh, they were all Jews. And even though Jews are a tiny minority, only 3% of the U.S. population in the 20th century, these songwriters captured the hearts and minds of all Americans with a huge number of popular songs. The Levy brothers don't get any credit. They owe me for a hundred yards of lace. If you promise me, my son, You'll collect from everyone. I can die with a smile upon my face. <laughs> but dear Mr. Shane, again I'll explain. It means you're the fairest in the land. an annual performance that celebrates the spirit of the 1960s with a year-by-year -year journey through the era. The show features live folk songs, newsreel images, anti-war buttons, and some far-out fashions. This year's event takes place on Friday, November 6th at the King Avenue Methodist Church. Visit spiritofthe1960s.com to learn more. Alfred Tibor is a sculptor whose works can be found in museums and private collections throughout the world, including the Yad Vashem Memorial in Jerusalem. This past spring, the 95-year-old Bexley resident and Holocaust survivor gifted three of his sculptures to the city of Upper Arlington, and you can find them at the Miller Park Library. I 
came back from Russia, from Siberia. And I found out I don't have my parents, I don't have anybody. 273 people, two of us survived. So one brother survived, Andrew and me. And that's why I made my first statue, a Holocaust memorial. Um, well, at the city, we believe a great community deserves great art. And so we have an arts and community spaces program where we put art in our parks, bringing art out of the gallery into the people. But we, of course, have known Alfred for many years because of his work with Holocaust memorials and education in our schools. Um, and so we started having a relationship with Alfred, and he started talking about these other pieces that he had at his home, and he was looking for a place for them. And lo and behold, after a number of conversations, he decided to put them here in Upper Arlington, and we're thrilled. We have 14 pieces total. We've put three here at Miller Park. We have another four in a spot yet to be determined, but we sort of have an idea. And then we've partnered with Dublin Arts Council to place seven sculptures there. The three pieces we have here are Movement, Free, and Ribbon Dancer. Um, and each of them are bronze sculptures, life-size, uh, that have themes to them that you would see in a park or a library or a community setting, movement, dance, freedom, um, and we, we just think they look really great here. There is no other way I could show a human being. They're so lyrical, I just they're just so beautiful. Um, he has a really wonderful eye for the human form. And considering Alfred and his history, you know, his surviving um, just man's atrocities to man during World War II, it's amazing to me that he has such a celebration of life, such a love for humanity. Uh, his message now is, you know, hate doesn't work, right? And so he's always celebrating life and our humanity. And I think that you're right, it really comes through in his artwork. I am defying the hatred. I am a survivor. The artist Marc Chagall was a pioneer of modernism, but as an Eastern European Jew in the early 20th century, his world was threatened with the rise of Nazism. With the onset of World War II, he fled to New York City, where themes of violence and disruption began to characterize his work, and the crucifixion of Christ became a frequent theme. For Chagall, the crucifixion was a metaphor for the horrors of war, and he equated the martyrdom of Jesus with the suffering of the Jewish people and the Holocaust. Last year, the Jewish Museum in New York City offered a glimpse into this lesser-known side of the artist, featuring works from his wartime exile. Here's more. I'm Bella Meyer, and I'm one of the grandchildren of Marc Chagall. I was very interested in uh, trying to figure out how he lived through the war times and he didn't really want to tell us about it because it was, it was too horrifying. And I always remember how he said that his way of fighting was by painting. And I'm really happy that Susan Goodman organized this very difficult show here on our grandfather's work during the period of the Holocaust and his exile in America. In 1922, Chagall and his wife and daughter left the Soviet Union to escape from the travails of the new Soviet regime. They moved to Paris and 
France became his second home, and he was very happy there. This was until the middle of the 1930s when the Nazi takeover of Europe began to occur, and Chagall began to feel that his world was collapsing once again and he had to become an exile in New York. So his work was responding to all of these incidents during the 1930s and early 1940s to the political situation, but also to his forced departure from Europe. The first theme in the exhibition is called Time as a River, and the concept of time or the years flowing as a moving river may have been important to Chagall in the sense that he left his family in Vitebsk and never went back. As a result, Chagall had to draw on his storehouse of images which keep repeating over the years. And I do believe it has something to do with the fact that he had tremendous nostalgia for the world that he had come from. The second theme in the exhibition is war and exile. There was violence and disruption which appears in a great deal of his work at this time. The most repeated image during these years was that of the Jewish Jesus. Jesus on the cross was a very transgressive image for one of the world's most important Jewish artists. In Artist with Yellow Christ, the Jesus figure is shown wearing a talit, a Jewish prayer shawl, instead of Christ's loincloth. Chagall is actually painting the Jewish Jesus, but we notice that he's turning away. There's a sense of an awkwardness at painting the Jewish Jesus at a time when Nazi incursions are escalating and there's this terrible suppression of liberties for Jews in Europe. The last section of the exhibition is called The Colors of Love. Between Darkness and Light is an extraordinary painting which provides premonitions of personal catastrophe that is to come because we see his wife, Bella, next to Mark. Their faces press against each other, but you have the sense that she's already a ghost. This picture was created during the year that Bella and Mark were waiting for an Allied victory and for the liberation of France. And the colors that we see, the red, white, and blue, are actually the French tricolor. And the irony here is that three days after the liberation, Bella got a virus and she died suddenly. He stopped painting for quite a while. And then later, there's another love in his life. Virginia was a breath of new life for him. And they commenced a romance. And subsequently, they moved to High Falls, New York, where they spent a very happy two years together. The painting Bride and Groom on Cock really speaks to their very happy period when they were living together. His paintings for me are like dreams because dreams help you understand the world. And even though all the little figures he painted seem to be incidental, they are all part of the bigger composition. They are like dreams. They appear and they go away again. And when you see a painting which you seem to have understood or defined precisely, you will always see yet another point which will make you laugh or make you sad or make you understand even further.
let's end the show by lightening things up a little. This next story features beers with names like Funky Jubilation and Hop Mana. The makers of Hebrew beer clearly take a fun and pun-filled approach to their microbrew labels. So let's visit the Schmaltz Brewing Company in Clifton Park, New York, to see their fresh approach to this age-old industry. This is the kind of company you get when you let an English major dream up a beer company. My name is Jeremy Cowan. I'm the owner of Schmaltz Brewing Company in Clifton Park, New York. We don't have formal mission and vision statements like we would in a uh, venture capital business model. This has been a very organic project for 17 years, creating Schmaltz Brewing Company. We come up with beers that are more based on concept and creativity than on market needs or trends or things like that. We're really into making these special products for ourselves and for the people that we love to drink beer with. There were a couple of kids in my school that were Jewish, myself, one of them, growing up in an area that wasn't particularly Jewish at the time in Northern California. And we thought, we need our own beer. What if we had one and be the only Jewish celebration beer in the country? We call it Hebrew. Punchline would be don't pass out, pass over. A little bit later, about 10 years later, when I was in my late 20s, I had the bug and I just started looking into what it would take to make a little bit of beer and call it Hebrew. It worked out to find what's called contract brewing. And it was just an opportunity to celebrate my own culture and what I was proud of and interested in. The very first batch of Hebrew Genesis Ale was 100 cases, hand bottled, hand labeled, delivered around in my grandmother's car because I didn't own a car at the time. It's been, you know, an endless series of challenges and, and adjustments because I never came from a brewery background. I didn't have a business background. And when you're trying to schlep around the country selling a beer called The Chosen Beer and you've got a dancing rabbi looming over a landscape from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Stones of Jerusalem, it's a very different endeavor than home brewer turned, you know, professional brewer with a dog or a fish or rolling hills, which is very typical of craft beer. I've tried to jam as many punchlines as I possibly could onto beer labels, but at the same time, we really take the beer seriously. It is supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be unique, it's supposed to be super creative, but we want the quality to be as good as the very best craft beers in the country. I did not get into this industry to own stainless steel tanks and pay the mortgage on an enormous warehouse. I got into it because I was excited about the product and the creative process and, and being able to share these wonderful beers on the shelf and in people's pints. I was very happy as a contract brewer and it's still an important part of the industry. So Death of a Contract Brewer I thought up as a fun celebration and a way to riff on the concept. Brewed with seven malts, seven hops, seven percent alcohol. We released the beer on July 7th, 7-7, and we had it for our first anniversary party, our grand opening here at the brewery. It was such a hit that we decided to make it into a year-round beer. So I'm really excited. It's a delicious black IPA that came out of the gates with very high ratings on the largest beer websites in the country and continues to grow. So I'm excited to share it with everybody. I think people love having products that have uniqueness and personality, that stand out on the shelf, that talk to you in a different way, and it's not really about traditional beer marketing, which, you know, Super Bowl ads and dancing girls and fast cars, and this is really more about a sense of artistry and a sense of creativity and being able to do something, we call it handcrafted, but it's, it's every element of the product and the project that is handcrafted as well, down to the images that we put on the labels. Our master brewer, Paul Mackerlane, spends hours so that the flavors that are gonna come through are something that's really spectacular and reflects the concept of the beer in the first place. The brewing side is a combination of art and science, and we're really lucky that I have such a great scientist who has this real compelling palette of artistry. We're also really proud of the art that we put on the outside of the label, and I've been working with the brewmaster and the artist for now over a decade on recipe development and translating that into images on the outside of the bottles. It's definitely one of the most fun parts of my job, is to be able to collaborate with these incredibly creative professionals that have brought so much to the Hebrew beer brand and the Schmaltz Brewing Company. Since we're small, we can't afford to make mistakes. We experiment with a sense of integrity, honesty, just like everybody, but we also have a lot of experience behind it. 
the flavors from the malts, the richness in the mouthfeel, the, the beautiful hop aromas and the flavors that can come from the pine and the citrus, the way those dance with the punchlines and the vocabulary on the outside and the images that are in the labels, and then how that goes into the market, bars, restaurants, and bottle shops around the country. How we interact with other brewers and other brewing professionals and the people in our community that we're participating with, that is all, I think, a sign of success. And it goes back to the flavors in each individual beer. And hopefully that entire channel is something that we're really proud of and that we get to share with all these people that are out there and call it Great Craft Beer. That's our show. To see all of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. We're closing today's show with the sounds of the local band known as Maza Blaska and a track off their 2011 album, Storyteller. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences.